If you have your Bibles, let's get them open to Ephesians chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, while you're getting your Bibles, I just want to acknowledge something that's kind of special. Uh, This morning we have in the room um, all of our current elders, Mike, myself, Ted, um, Aaron, who is just up here sharing. We also have in the room right now four of Reach's founding elders and pastors. Uh, That would be myself, Chris Tony, uh, Robbie, uh, Helene, and his family are in visiting from Colorado. Um, And and then we just had moved back uh, the Aldridges, Heath and Amanda Aldridge and their family. So um, we uniquely right now have uh, have multiple eras of Reach leadership here. And I just think that's a special thing. It's worth acknowledging and celebrating uh, the faithfulness of God in this church throughout the years and the various faithful families that he has provided uh, for us. Um, uh, many of you guys know our official kind of anniversary comes in July, our birthday, uh, if you will. And so this year in July, Reach turns nine years old. Um, and it has been quite the ride and God has been faithful through it all. I'm going to pray for us and then we're just going to read God's word together and unpack that. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much um, for your faithfulness, uh, for your goodness to us, for your provision for us. As uh, Michelle said, Lord, in, in the highs and lows and the ups and downs, God, you are present and you are faithful and you are good. Um, God, we pray that this morning as we read your word, God, that you would teach us through the reading of your word, that your Holy Spirit would fall in this place. You would fill your people. You would shape us and form us to look um, and live more like you. God, may you be glorified in all we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, if you would, uh, we're going to read Ephesians 3, 1 through 13, and then we're just going to walk through that together. It begins this way, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though, I am the very least of all the saints." This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. This is the word of the Lord this morning. Amen. Um, And so as we get into this, for me, I I think you're going to see that this passage is a very missional passage. Um, it, It definitely touches on themes of suffering And overall for me, it's just kind of been this idea that what God is doing and what God is up to is something bigger than me. He's up to something bigger than you, that God has an eternal purpose in everything he does. Um, And and so I just want to kind of look at it through that lens this morning um, in in light of the various things, you know, you may be going through a high right now, you may be going through a low, Um, you may be in a rough season, um, and and really just life may be like, forget the season, it just may be a a rough life. And, And in all of those things, trying to discern what is God doing and why is he doing it? And then just this, this missional, eternal lens that, that Paul kind of has on for us this morning. Um, and so let's just begin verse one. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Paul, um, I don't know if we've mentioned it actually in, in, in all of our leading up to this, but Paul is writing the book of Ephesians from prison. Um, He's actually under house arrest in Rome, chained to a Roman 
guard. Uh, we know that from Acts chapter 28, verse 16. Um, and, and so technically and humanly speaking, Paul is a prisoner of Nero and a prisoner of Rome, and he is awaiting a court appearance. But Paul doesn't seem to see it that way, right? Like what Paul says is, I, Paul, a prisoner of who? Christ, right? That Paul, um, in, in, in what I think we could call this, if you're in prison of any sort, um, that's probably a low, right? That's not the highs of life. That's the lows of life. And Paul, um, like Michelle was saying, Paul is able to say in a low period of his life that I am right where God wants me to be. I'm exactly where God would have me to be. He's not a prisoner of Rome. He is a prisoner of Christ because he is convinced that all of life, both the highs and the lows, are governed uh, by the sovereign lordship of Christ. And so Paul knows he is exactly where God would have him to be. And then the second part of verse one, he just says, on behalf of of the Gentiles, on behalf of you Gentiles. And this was just the reality um, that Paul is in prison um, because of opposition from the Jews or, or uh, like an extreme kind of sect of Jews or the leaders of the Jews who didn't like Paul's message. That Paul is literally in prison um, because he had a bold and uncompromising belief that the kingdom of God was available to the Gentiles. And it was for the Gentiles as well, right? And, and if you, um, you were here last week, and you probably know, you have the Jews, which are God's people, and then the Gentiles are everyone else, right? So most of us in here are Gentiles. So I think another way that you could see this is um, that Paul had a desire and a heart to get the gospel to the nations, right? That, that's another way that you could see what he's talking about here. And, and at the same time, keep in mind that Paul is not a Gentile. Paul is a Jew, Right? And so I, I think it's fitting and it's, and it's okay that at least in part, when we read verse one, you could also kind of take from that this, that um, it was God's will for Paul to suffer for the sake of others. Does that make sense? Right? It was God's will for Paul to suffer for the sake of others. This is where Paul begins the section we're in today in verse 1, that he is in prison on behalf of the Gentiles. And then in verse 13, uh, we're going to see where he closes our passage for this morning, is, is he reminds or he encourages the Gentiles not to lose heart in what, uh, because of what he is suffering for them. And so he both begins and ends this section with a reference to his suffering, but not for himself that he's suffering because God has given him a mission and God has given him a gospel, a good news that is meant for the nations. Are you with me so far? Um, and, and so this is where this begins. And I think it's important because do we not, especially in our culture, have a tendency to get overly focused on our personal comforts and preferences? You know, we, 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 we saw last week um, that God is building his church. Christ is building his church upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Um, Jesus most certainly, Paul most certainly, but most of, of the apostles and the prophets, do you know they died a horrible death, right? For the sake of the gospel and to get the gospel out, that they had a life full of discomforts for the sake of Christ, Right? And so if that's the foundation on which the church is being built, why do so many of us try to build churches of comforts and ease? You know, I, it was, I was talking to, to Chuck this week, and, and he just used this phrase that, that church should be hard, that community is hard, that following Jesus is hard, and, and so many Christians are trying to, to like make it sound easy. Um, and yet we know that Jesus died for the sake of others and Paul and, and their lives are both marked by suffering and sacrifice for the gospel. If you read, let's keep going. Verse two, 
He says, assuming, um, and, and by the way, there's this like long kind of uh, dash in my Bible. I'm sure most of your Bibles have it. it it's meant to kind of show uh, that kind of mid-sentence, Paul is like interrupts himself. And, and then what we kind of study in, and I think that verse one is picked up in verse 14, which we'll talk about next week. Um, but the rest of our time this morning is kind of this parenthetical thought that Paul has, although incredibly relevant, is kind of a break in his original thought. Um, and here's what he says in verses two through six. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations or the people in other generations as has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Um, he, he goes on and he says here, the stewardship of God's grace. Some of your Bibles may use the language dispensation of God's grace or administration of God's grace. It simply means that God chose to give Paul a gift of grace that was not meant to end on him. It was meant for the Gentiles. Do you see that? That, that God, Paul, God gave to Paul a gift of grace for the Gentiles. So God has chosen to make Paul a prisoner for the Gentiles and then has given him a grace uh, that was for the Gentiles. And, and he tells us and he used, he begins to unpack this grace that God has given to him and he refers to it as a mystery. Okay? And that word mystery that's used in, in, in the Bible is a little different than the way that we use it. Like when we talk about a mystery, we're talking about something that's like obscure or difficult to understand. Um, but if you're like somewhat of a Sherlock Holmes, if you have good detective skills, you could figure it out, right? Like that's a mystery. Um, but, but biblically, when the Bible tends to use this term mystery, um, it, it, it is referring to a truth that is beyond human discovery, but has now been revealed by God and made known to the church. Okay, so it's not something that you're going to figure out on your own. It is a truth that was hidden. This is what he says in verse 5, that they are truths previously hidden that have now been disclosed through revelation by the Spirit. Does that make sense? You see the subtle difference. Um, okay, and, and this is just for some of you might appreciate this. Others of you may not care as much. Um, but if you look closely... At verses 2, 4, and 5, you're going to see the whole trinity at work in this mission, right? It, it says that God the Father reveals the mystery of God the Son by God the Holy Spirit so that Paul can take the gospel to the nations. Like, do you see the whole trinity is at work in what is going on here? That this is, this is not the church's mission, that this is God's mission to make disciples of the nations. That this is what the church is about. This was the life and the ministry that Paul was given. And then he just makes it very clear in verse 6. Um, the mystery is that Gentiles, the nations, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because we, we went through this at length last week. Um, but Paul, once again, very clearly unpacks what he said at the end of chapter 2, that Christ, by his death and blood, tore down the dividing walls of hostility that exist between Jew and Gentile and between a fallen humanity and our holy God. Um, and, and that in doing so, Jesus did not come, if you were here last week, we just made it clear, Jesus did not come to make Jewish people Gentiles, and he did not come to make Gentiles Jewish, right? What he does is he creates a whole new multicultural humanity known as the church, right? It says that he created one new man in place of the two. That's what we saw last week. And so today he's just saying um, that both Jews and Gentiles are equally citizens of this new kingdom. 
equally members of the household of God, equally being built into a holy temple, a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You guys remember that. That was a lot of what we talked about last week. Also, just if you weren't here, I want to point out, because I think it's important, Uh, We said last week that those are really three of the most important spheres in the ancient world. The the three most important areas of life would have been the kingdom that you belong to or the kingdom in which you are a citizen, the family that you came from, and the way and the place in which you worshiped. Like those would have been the three most important area, uh, spheres in the ancient world. And um, specifically your kingdom, if you were Roman, uh, your, the Greeks really were, had this huge emphasis on the families they were from. And, and the Jews, obviously the temple where God dwelled. Paul uses those three pictures to say, this is what the church is like. Right? This, this is the church. And this mystery um, that people from all nations would be together in God's family. It was made possible through Christ or in Christ and through the gospel. And so that's a little bit of a recap of both last week, but retouching on what Paul says this week. And let's move on in verse seven. He says, of this gospel, I was made a minister. Okay, and I just wanna kind of, point out to you the passive nature in that language. Paul did not make himself a minister. Um, It it doesn't seem like this was his necessarily aspiration or goal. He says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Um, And if you just look at the beginning there, he says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the power, uh, by the working of his power, And it was given to him that he might preach to the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches. Um, And so the gospel was revealed to Paul, but it wasn't just for Paul. You know, it was revealed to Paul for the sake of the Gentiles that he was supposed to take what God revealed to him and he was supposed to carry it or share it with the nations that he has become a minister, which just means a servant, by the way. Like ministers are not lords. We are supposed to be servants. He was made a servant of the gospel uh, so that he could carry the good news to the nations. And so what has been given to Paul, by God, is intended to be shared. It is not just for Paul. And, and here's this like, thing that I constantly have to learn, um, that, that God does a lot of things in my life and, and, and maybe through my life or, or in my friends' lives because he loves me and because he loves you. But there is a difference in God does things in my life because he loves me and, and, and then it being all about me. Right? Like I am not the star of even my story because it's not my story, it's his story. It is about Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And so Paul is in prison for the Gentiles. He has been revealed a mystery uh, by God, and it was not just for him, it was for the Gentiles. And then Paul, in this whole thing, he says, to me, though, I am the very least of all the saints. And and so hear me out. Um, I'm not going to call this like holy self-deprecation or anything like that. Um, but, but here's what I'm going to say. I, I do think there is a time and a way in which it is okay and maybe even right and good to minimize yourself for the purpose of magnifying the glory and grace of God. That like Paul is not coming at this saying, I am the, the worst pastor. I, I'm not, I, I can't do this. He's not using his weakness as an excuse to not be engaged in the mission. He's using his weakness as a means of of just saying, can you believe how gracious our God is? Can Can you believe, like it's almost just like this outburst of surprise that God would use him. And I and I think 
Paul is not like, this is not false humility here. I think Paul, and, and I say this because I think this is probably many of us. Um, Paul is very aware of who he was. Paul is very aware of his sins and his failures. He is very aware that he was like the primary leader of the persecution of the church. And he's just like, how wild is it that out of all the people God could have used for this mission, he chose me, right? That, 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 and this again is not an excuse for him to sit on the sidelines. It's not an excuse for him to say, I'm, I'm not going to engage in ministry. Um, I, I think if any of us in here, and I think it's a lot of us feel inadequate for the roles or the things that God has called us to. You know, maybe you are in a season that you just feel completely inadequate to bear. You know, when, when you got married, you probably felt very inadequate or, or, or ill-equipped for what laid ahead. Um, I, I remember when we had Sophie, when she was born, I was just telling someone this the other day, that feeling, um, we, we, Rachel gave birth, we gave birth, she did, whatever, um, at a birthing center. And I remember um, at birthing centers, they're not like hospitals. They don't keep you for three days. It's like they feed you a meal and within four hours you're out. And so we have the baby and it's like four hours later, I'm holding this tiny little life as we're walking out to the car thinking, I don't think this is a good idea. That they would like, who just does this? Who gives a little baby to someone and just says like, good luck. There wasn't like a, a, a like required training course. They just gave her to me and let us leave. And there's something about that that I just had this feeling of, I don't know that I am prepared for this. You know, and I think a lot of us, when we think of things like making disciples or sharing the gospel um, or that, that God wants to use you for the sake of the kingdom, I think many of us would agree with Paul that we feel like the least of all the saints, you know, that, that we are not equipped for what is about to come, that we are woefully inadequate. But I think, right, here, here's the thing. Um, and some of us have maybe thought this. Some of you have maybe said this. Have you ever said something like, I'm not sure that I have anything to offer, right? Have you ever heard that before, thought that before? I don't know that I have anything to offer. And here's, as I read this, um, here's the only way I think that could be true, that if I'm going to be so bold to say I have nothing to offer, then I need to be so bold to say God has revealed nothing to me. God has done nothing for me. God has given nothing to me. Because so far, everything that Paul has, has, that the Lord has revealed to Paul, Paul says, it's not just for me, it's for me to share with others. And everything that Paul has been given by God is not just for him, it's for the nations. And so for me to say, I don't think I have anything to offer is to say, I don't think God has taught me anything. I don't think God has given anything to me. But if God has taught you something, if he has revealed to you truths of himself, if he, is, if he has given you any gifts in your life, if he has done anything for you, all of those things are testimonies meant to be shared for the expanse of the kingdom. You have something to offer. If you are in Christ and you are filled by the Holy Spirit, you have something to offer. Everything that God has done in your life is meant to form you and shape you into a conduit of his grace that is meant to flow through you to the nations. That's what Paul's been saying. Are you with me so far? Verse seven, he says, when Paul says that he was made a minister by the working of his power, um, in verse seven, it, it means kind of the way in which he says that, this is, this is the way I would interpret this passage is um, that his limitations as a minister, Paul's limitations as a minister are not determined by his own abilities. His only limits um, are the boundaries of the power of God. That, that he is a minister, not in his own strength, but he is a minister, right? The means by which he ministers, the strength by which he ministers is not his own strength and power. It is the Lord's strength and power. And, and the reality is, um, if you haven't been here already, you will at some point find yourself in a role with a title 
or, or in some type of suffering that is just frankly and honestly beyond your soul's ability to manage. And, and this may sound strange, but, but I, I believe it is by God's grace that we come to an end of ourselves, the end of ourselves, and just realize I can't. And it is in that place that we realize that God's grace is sufficient for us for his power is made perfect in our what weakness. You know, you could theoretically, hypothetically, I'm not like suggesting this, but if you had enough money, you could gift me an airplane, right? And, and you could by grace, give me a jet hypothetically. And you could by grace um, call me a, a pilot or a captain or whatever the people f- that fly the plane are, fly the plane. I think it's like this. Um, <laughs> but here's the deal. Um, if you can't also empower me supernaturally to know how to fly that plane, I don't recommend you getting on that plane with me because it's going to go poorly. And, and here's the reality. What, what all Paul just said is that God never gives you a responsibility that he doesn't empower you to see through. That God's grace, that when God um, called Paul, when God saved Paul, he saved Paul for the sake of others because of his love for Paul, but also his plan was to use Paul to share the gospel for the sake of others. That, that when he um, began to taught, teach Paul, taught Paul, teach Paul, and reveal things to Paul, that it wasn't just for Paul, it was for the nations, right? When, when he gives him grace and strength, it is for the nations, um, And so it is in this way that we we receive God's power. And in this way, we are both privileged to be a part of the work that God is doing in the world, while at the same time, he is able to receive 100% of the glory. Does that make sense? Like this is what God is doing. Um, Verses 10 and 11, read this with me. So that through the church... And this is, this is crazy, okay? Just check this out. And, and I may be wrong about this. I'm going to give you the way I, I interpret this, and, and I have good reason for it. Um, but verses 10 and 11, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God mo- might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose. Hear that word, the eternal purpose. So God has an eternal purpose in everything he does. Uh, the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Um, Similar language to this language of the rulers and authorities in heavenly places is used later on in chapter six. And so we'll dive more into that there. Um, but, But just for short purposes today, what I believe he's talking about here are the angels and demons. And so just check this out with me. He, if that is true, Um, he's saying that what God is doing in us, that is in the church, um, that at times may make no earthly sense to me and you. Like I may not see fully what God is doing. I may not fully understand the eternal weight and the eternal glory, but it seems that at times God is, or, or doing a thing in us to teach angels and demons something about the multifaceted wisdom of God. Like there's something about that. That's crazy to me. You know, that, that God is writing a story that he is both the author and director of, um, and, and history. One, one person explained it like history is the stage and, and the church is the, are the actors and, and the, uh, the rulers and authorities in heavenly places are like the audience and they're watching us and they're learning things about the nature and character and wisdom of God. And so here's the thing, that there are things that God is doing in Paul's life that is not just about Paul but is meant to go through Paul to the, to the nations and to the Gentiles. But then hear this, that, that God is forming one new humanity of Jews and Gentiles. And then Paul just said, and there are things that God is doing in the church that is even bigger than that. There are things that God is doing in us and through us and angels and demons are watching and they are learning something about God. That like God is up to something far 
bigger and far greater than I could imagine. And my comfort, Johnny's comfort, my little part in history is not the point of it all. It is all to point to Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. You know, and could you imagine if you were an angel, like you, you've, you've seen God and they're watching those of us who walk by faith and that God has poured out his Holy Spirit and, and watching us as we make foolish decisions and God is gracious and like they're watching all of this just being blown away at, at the gospel, right? Because remember, it was hidden. No one knew it. Not even the angels were aware of what God's plan was in and through his church. Does that make sense? And so there's something bigger going on here. And, and then as we kind of wrap up, move to the last two verses, read, read with me just verse 12. In whom, referring to Jesus Christ our Lord from the end of verse 11, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Um, here's what I think is most interesting about this. At this point, this would have been a great time for Paul to say, in light of all this, get to work. In light of all this, why are you just sitting there? Get busy, people. Well, there's work to do. There's kingdom work to do. But, but instead, he shifts it and he says, because of the faithfulness of Jesus, church, we can continually come into the presence of God without fear but with confidence. And that word boldly, it means to speak boldly or to speak frankly. And I think this is important, okay? And, and I, I'm gonna say this, and I, and I think I, I'm, I'm okay to say it. I, I really believe because of verse one where Paul began and because of what you're about to see in the next verse that Paul has suffering in mind here. I think what he just said is there are things that God is doing in him that is not about him, but it is is for the gospel to be spread among the nations. And there are things that God is doing in the church, and that's even bigger than the church. It's something that he's a communicating to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And then he just says, so church, because of the faithfulness of Christ, you can come into the presence of God and you can speak openly. And I just wonder if there's not a sense that what he's saying is is there are times in which Christian ease is just not going to cut it. There, is, there are times when a Bible verse um, just isn't what you want to hear or doesn't solve the suffering you're going through. And that may sound like heresy to you. I'm just saying I felt it. It's true at times. And, and I think what he's saying is there are times where what you need is to come into the presence of your father who is abundantly gracious. He is, like it is in his presence that we receive the grace to, to, to do the tasks and the things that God has called us to do. And he just says, speak openly. Like there are times, and, and maybe you've been there. If you haven't been there, you probably will be there, um, where your prayer life just might look more like doubt or more like anger or more like hurt. Like, God, Why? Why would you do this to this person I love? Why would you have me in this season? Why would you have me in this place? And, and Paul at this point just says, I just want you to know you don't have to pretend in the presence of God. I just want you to know that in the highs and the lows, because of the faithfulness of Christ, you can come into the presence of God with confidence and you can say exactly what's on your heart. And I've told you this before, you pray what you got, pray as you are, not as you think you should be. You know, don't, you don't need to come into the presence of God and try to like think of like, is this theologically accurate? Just pray what's on your heart. And I've told you before, like if there's something you're asking God for, you pray for that thing until God does it or until God changes your heart. But, but I don't think you have to come and feel guilty if something is, is really what you feel. You don't have to pretend with God because he already knows. So come into his presence because of Christ and speak openly and frankly and God is gracious, and it is in that place that he gives us grace. It is in that place that he pours out his grace on his people. And, and, I, and I believe that this is what Paul has in mind because of the next verse. He says, therefore, in verse 13, therefore, 
or so I ask you, means therefore do not lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Do not be discouraged. Do not grow weary because my suffering, says Paul, has led to your glory. He says, I I preached the gospel to the Gentiles. I was privileged by God to spread this mystery among the nations. And it is, yes, because of that, that I am in prison. But it is also because of that, that I am talking to you now, even you in this room, as brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, like, yes, I am in prison because of it, but also your glory is because of it, right? Your place in the kingdom is because of it. And so Paul's just saying, don't lose heart. You can bring anything to the father. He is not afraid. He is, he is not going to push you away. He just wants to hear what's on your heart. Come in, share, forget the Christianese, forget, forget the memes or whatever else. You just can come into the presence of God, broken, tired, scared, angry, upset in all of the ways. And you can just speak frankly to God and do not be discouraged because in it all, God is doing something. There is an eternal purpose, a a heavenly weight of glory that is being prepared for all of us. And you may not see it now, but God is faithful and God is at work. And you, in a very real sense, we all are here now because someone suffered and died, right? We're going to go all the way back. We're going to start that with Jesus who suffered and died. Um, but, but then frankly, Paul really credited for bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul suffered and died. And, and we could just go on this list of lots of faithful Christians who, when they said, I will follow Jesus, it looked like being united with him and his suffering and death, um, that we might receive the gospel. So I'm going to invite the team up. Um, but, but here at Reach, we have this saying that we are God's family on mission, um, that we exist to make disciples of the nations, beginning here in our families and in our church and in our community. And it is our desire to live in such a way that makes it clear that this life is not about us. It is about Jesus and his eternal purposes. And um, I, I want you to hear me as we kind of wrap this up and 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 that if you are feeling woefully inadequate, in one sense, I want to say that's not true. In another sense, I want to tell you it is true. (laughs) You are woefully inadequate. Um, But if you are in Christ, you have been given the Holy Spirit and you are now woefully empowered to do things that you are not capable of in your own strength for the glory of God. And God has a plan and a purpose for your life and he is working all things Um, for the good of those who love him. And so trust him, come into his presence, be honest, receive his grace. Um, If you would bow your heads with me. And and during this time, as we go into worship, we open up uh, the Lord's table to you to come near and partake in his body and blood um, for the strengthening of your soul and uh, to remind us of the gospel and the blood that he shed for us. It is because of Jesus, the cornerstone, his life, death, and resurrection that we are even here. And so when you come to this table, would you um, come remembering that this is, he didn't just save you as an individual, that we come together corporately as a family um, to worship him this morning, to sit under the teaching of his word, to feast on his presence, that we might receive grace, and power for the call that he has placed on our lives. And so God, we come before you right now and I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you begin moving in this room as you already have been, so not begin, but continue moving in this room over the hearts of your sons and daughters. God, would you strengthen the saints for the work of the ministry that you have called us to? Would you comfort those of us who are in seasons of of hurt or pain or scared? Um, when there are things going on that we just don't understand, where they make no earthly sense, God, may uh, we be reminded. God, would you help comfort us and, and remind us that you have an eternal purpose that is not worth comparing. 
to the momentary afflictions that we face. God, that we may be struck down but not destroyed. Yeah. So God, would you fill your church this morning to overflowing, that we might be conduits of your gospel and grace to the nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.